name of the Lord Jesus. God is good. Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, let us go to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 19 as we stand and read. Tasha, good to see you and your girls tonight. God bless them in the name of the Lord. Praise God. Let's stand and let's read the word of the Lord. Pray for all those that are not here tonight. God will touch and bless in Jesus' name. The Bible says, why they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same bondage is he brought into, or of the, for a for of whom, for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought into bondage. I knew I'd get it out right here in a minute. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For to whom a man is overcome, well, whatever overcomes a man, of the same is he brought into bondage. I want to minister tonight, if my voice will allow me. Amen. I want to minister on this. False freedom. All right. Everybody say false freedom. All right. Amen. Brother David Johnson, ask God's blessing on the word, sir. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence in this lonely place. God, we ask that you bless this, bless the message, bless the messenger. Let it be used to minister your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody say amen. amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> the devil, as the scripture tells us, is a liar and the father of liars. And the only way that the devil can deceive, the only way that the devil can trick, the only way the devil can get you to fail and to fall is that he can get you to believe the lies that he whispers into your ears. And one of the greatest lies that he propagates is this, that if you live for God, you are under some type of bondage because you cannot do what you want to do. You cannot live the way you want to live, and so on and so forth. And because people have listened to that lie for so long, they begin to believe it, and they no longer live for God. They no longer serve God because they have the Spirit and they have the attitude, I am my own man, I am my own woman. And I am going to do exactly what I please, and I am going to live how I please, and I am going to go to places that I please, and nobody's going to tell me what to do. But yet, if we are truly honest with ourselves and with what the Scripture declares in our Scripture reading, we find that the opposite is really true. For the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 19, For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. In other words, people are slaves to whatever overcomes them. I don't care what it is. I don't care where it's coming from. If something overcomes you, if something takes dominion in your life, you have become a slave to that very thing. Freedom is a concept that so is misunderstood. Amen. But yet freedom is a concept that is so important for us to understand, not only in this world that we live and in the church world today. Right. Amen. It, it seems like freedom understands, amen, that I can do and I can go and I can say whatever. But yet when you begin to realize what true freedom means, freedom means that we take responsibility for our actions. Freedom means we take responsibility for our lives. Freedom means that we live a life of discipline that we are not overcome by the corruption. We are not overcome by sin. We are not overcome by degradation, amen, that inflicts many people. And so really people do not understand the true meaning of freedom because everybody from the communist in red China to the playboy 
somebody that spends thousands and thousands of dollars a night in Las Vegas, Nevada. Their word, their definition of freedom is totally opposite because it is their own definition that fits the parameters of their life. And we need to understand that nobody is completely free from the sense of having the ability and the opportunity to do what I ever want to do. Amen. Because if you want to go 85 miles an hour down 301, you're going to be pulled over and you're going to be given a ticket. Amen. You say, I have freedom and I'm going to do what I want to. And so you go into the bank tomorrow morning and you point a gun at the teller and say, this is a stick up. You're going to end right there. Amen. Because it's a false freedom. When we have the idea and we have the thinking and the philosophy, I am free. I can do what I want to do. I can act any way that I, I want to act. I can say anything that I want to say. Amen. But doing whatever you do, whatever you want to do, it's not freedom. When you do whatever is pleasing to your sight, it's not freedom. But in actuality, but in actuality, that so-called freedom, amen, becomes a bondage because, once again, of whom a man is overcome, whatever overcomes an individual, whatever takes charge and a position of authority and preeminence and predominance in their life, they have become slaves to that. They have been brought under bondage for whatever themselves are slaves to, amen, they are slaves to what overcomes them. So yet, in reality, amen, they are not free. They have a false freedom and they walk around, amen, with a false concept and a false understanding and a believing lie that when they come into the place of true freedom, when they can know true freedom in Jesus Christ, they battle within themselves and they fight within themselves, amen, and they can never get the total victory because on the one hand, they say, I'm doing what I want to do, but on the other hand, Jesus is saying, hey, come to me and I will give you freedom. Come to me and I will give you joy. Come to me and I will give you peace. And when they hear the words of Jesus, they also hear the words of Satan. But if you do that, you've got to give up this. You've got to give up that. You can't do this and you can't do that. And so he lies and he says, continue to do what you're doing. But in actuality, you are giving yourself a false freedom and you are putting yourself into bondage and you are putting yourself into slavery and you are putting yourself it behind a prison wall that only Jesus is going to be able to set you free from. It's only Jesus that can give you true freedom today. I'm talking about an answer that will satisfy your soul. I'm talking about an answer today that will bring peace and joy to your heart and to your life. And I know Peter was talking about false apostles. I know Peter was talking about false preachers and, and deceptive liars as you read Second Peter chapter number 2. Amen. But it is with anything that comes our way and begins to propagate and speak to us a word. Amen. Begins to speak to us a something within our spirit. Amen. That Amen. This is the way it is. This is the way it is. This is the way it is. But I'm here to tell you the only way that it is is with Jesus Christ. Because he said in John 14, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He has come. For the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is victory. There is victory. There is liberty. There is freedom. And there is anointing. Don't allow the world and don't allow Satan to whisper into your heart and into your life. Amen, Amen about a false freedom. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 17, speaking about these false teachers and, and the words that they speak, verse 18 says they, they speak great swelling words of vanity, and they allure you, they draw you, amen, through the lust of the flesh. But yet he says in verse 17, they are like springs without water and mist driven along before a temptest for whom was reserved forever the gloom of darkness. Do you see what Peter is saying? Amen. He's saying they are a well, amen 
man, but the waters are gone. I want you to think for a moment. You can call a well a well all day long, even if it doesn't have any water. But that well is useless if there is no water. And so Peter is saying, amen, about these people and about just anything that may hold power over us. They are wells. They may have the sign here. There is a well here, but it's without water. He goes on to say, they are clouds that are carried about with a tempest and and they are carried about with the wind to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. They are clouds that seemingly appear dark. And you may look and say, well, here comes the refreshing rain. Here comes the renewing rain. Here comes the blessing of a spring shower or a late evening shower to cool things off. But yet as the thunder rolls and the lightning flashes, nothing comes forth out of the clouds because even though they may be dark, they are empty. And this is what the devil does. He will promise you something. He will offer to give you something but yet beside behind that something it's an empty cloud and it's an empty well that there is no water there is no nourishment there is no refreshing there is no freedom and there is no liberty and victory everybody say amen. amen so we see the clouds of fog or the mist being driven by the wind Amen. Only to announce the possibility of rain. They announce the possibility of a windstorm coming, but yet they are empty. Jude says something like this, and I find it very interesting in Jude chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. But these speak evil of these things which they know not. And of course, once again, he's, re, he's speaking about, amen, evil preachers and teachers, those that don't carry the gospel. But once again, let me lay before you this fact, anything can speak into your life. Whether you realize it or not, anything can speak into your life. It may not be audible words such as you are hearing tonight, but it can be a signal. It, it could be a sign. Amen. It could be something in print. Amen. It doesn't matter that it will speak into your life things that they know not. Good example of this. Look at the politicians today. They talk about a bunch of things, but they don't know what they're talking about. Hello. Amen. You hear all this stuff from the left. You hear all this stuff from the right. And in actuality, it's just empty words. I, I've heard, amen, some of these politicians say if, if they would just quit talking about what they're going to do and start doing it, then something may get done. But they know they're never going to do what they promised to do because nobody wants to pay the price. Amen. And so the Bible says they speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute, uh, brute things, in these things, they corrupt themselves. So the freedom that is alluded to, the liberty that is alluded to from these things that speak into your life, what they actually do is they begin to corrupt you. They begin to torment you. They begin to bring rot to you. Look what verse 11 and says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. What was the problem with Cain and Abel? Abel offered the firstlings of his flock. Abel offered that which was holy. Abel offered that which was right. And, and, and there's some that will say, well, he offered a blood sacrifice, and that made the difference. I, I don't think it was necessarily the blood sacrifice that made the difference. The Bible says Abel offered the firstlings, the firstlings. That was the representation of the tithe. That was the representation of the best that he had. And the Bible says that Cain offered Amen. An offering of the fruit of the ground. Well, he was a farmer. He was a farmer. And when you read the book of the Levitical law, you will find out that there were grain offerings that was acceptable to God. There were tithe that was given as grain offerings unto God that was acceptable unto him. The fruit of the trees such as, amen, the grain of the field. But what was the difference between Cain and Abel? Cain did not bring his best. Abel brought the best to God. Cain did not. He was at the place where I'm going to bring what I want to bring and let God accept that. Right. And then the Lord came to him and said, Cain, if you do not well, will you not be accepted? Right. God didn't say you had to change your offering. Right. He didn't say you had to go out there and get a sheep and, and slay it. He said, do your best. Do what is right. 
Bring the best that you have. But Cain was listening to the voice. Just give what you got. Just give what you want to give. Do what you want to do. Live the way that you want to live. And the Bible tells us that the way of Cain is evil. And then it goes on to say, and ran greedily. After the era of Balaam for the reward, Balaam was hired, amen, to curse Israel, amen. And the Bible tells us that Balaam said three times, I cannot curse what God has blessed. I cannot curse what God has blessed. And it made the king who hired him very angry. But what ultimately happened, amen, Balaam began to tell that king, hey, you begin to intermarry with them. You begin to let them compromise. You begin to let them, amen, to rebel against the word of God, and you will have them where you want them. My theology 101, but basically that's what it was. And so when we are at the place that the devil says and the world says, live any way that you want to. Do whatever. And if you want to go to church, that's fine. If you want to lift your hands, that's fine. But just do what you want to do. Amen. But you're walking down a destructive path because those things that speak into your life will corrupt you. Amen. And perish after the gainsaying of Korah. Let's go to the next verse. Verse number 12, the Bible says, These are spots. These are spots in your feast of charities. These holy feasts, they were filled with spots. They were, they were not pure and they were not acceptable. That when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, the Bible says they are clouds that are without water. They are clouds without water. They have a pretense, and they have a show of something. But in actuality, they are not what they are. These clouds are carried about by the winds. Amen. And the trees, amen, they begin to produce a little bit. But yet the fruit begins to wither. Amen. Without fruit. And the trees then are said to be twice dead and plucked up by the roots. Why? Because they were declared freedom. They were declared you do this, just do what you want to, and you will be able to be free. But in actuality, it's going to bring death. It's going to bring corruption. It is going to bring the destruction of your soul. It becomes a false thinking and a false freedom. When we are continuously thinking about ourselves and indulging in the flesh of sin, amen, we, we, we are being carried about as a corpse. We are full of rottenness. We are full of death because the life that has been afforded to us by Jesus Christ, we have let it loose and we have turned it aside that I am going to fulfill the lust of my flesh. But we are like trees that are twice dead, plucked up by the roots, and we are clouds being carried by the wind. But there is no water because whatever overcomes you, Whatever takes authority and predominance in your life, you have become a slave to it. Right. Let me give you an example, and I think this is probably one of the greatest examples that we could ever look at. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. The Lord Peter, or Paul speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to the church at Ephesus, he said, in times past... You walked according to the course of this world. You thought you were free. You thought you were doing exactly what you wanted to do. You thought you were living the way that you wanted to live. But in actuality, Paul was saying in times past before Calvary, you walked according to the course of this world. Whether you realized it or not, you walked according to the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? That's the devil. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. What Paul is saying, when you think you're living in freedom and you think you're doing what you want to do, you actually have become a slave to the devil because the devil can control you. The devil can manipulate you when you feed and you feel after the lust of the flesh and the lust of the mind. This is where he gains power. This is where he gains authority. This is where he gains control because it puts it in your spirit. Do what you want to do. Live like you want to live. Enjoy your life. Amen. Accomplish what you want to accomplish. And be your own woman. Be your own man. Be your own person. But the devil knows that when you begin to walk after that course, after that calling, you actually 
are walking under his dominion. You are walking under his control and his authority. Verse number three, for verse number three says, among whom also we had our conversation. Now that's more than speech. That is our life. This word conversation actually means life, our lifestyle in times past. So of whom also we all had our lifestyle in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and mind, and were by nature of the children of wrath, even as others. So he's telling us, in one time, you walked habitually, whether you realized it or not. You were following, whether you realized it or not, the course and the fashion of this world. You are under the sway of the tendency of this present age. Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So I am not going to allow my thoughts, I am not going to allow my mind to deviate off the word of God. I am going to dwell upon him. I am going to think upon him. I am going to focus upon him. I am going to adore him. I am going to worship him. I am going to love him. And I am not going to follow the lust of my flesh. Because when you follow the principality of the power of the air, you actually were obedient to him and under the control of the demon spirit. Go back to verse number two, if you can, real quick. Verse number two, you are under control of the, don't, I'm not saying you are demon possessed, don't say that, but you are under control of the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You are walking and living carelessly under the spirit of rebellion and unbelieving against the purposes of God because that demonic spirit is constantly working in the sons, in the daughters, in the children of disobedience. What are we in disobedience to? We are in disobedience to the word of God. When we are following our lusts, when we are following our desires, when we are following our plan, when we are following our purpose, we think we are living in freedom. We think we are living in liberty. But you have become a slave. You have become a slave to that which has control over you. That's why the drug addict can't seem to get free. That's why the alcoholic can't seem to get free. That's why the habitual liar continues to lie. That's why the thief continues to steal. And they say, well, I just can't help myself. Why is that? Because you are under control. Of the course, the passion, the desire, the spirit of this world. Yes, they say you have freedom. But it has become your master. It has become your Lord. It has become your God. Amen. And so you once lived and conducted in your life and according to the passions of your flesh. In other words, your, your, your behavior. Your life was governed by corrupt and essential nature, obeying the impulses of the flesh instead of obeying God. The thoughts of the mind, our cravings that we crave, amen, they were dictating to our senses and our dark imaginations, and they were giving us a false sense of security. They were giving us a false place that, oh, you are free. You are doing what you are doing, amen, but yet they did not understand, amen, as Paul said, amen, you are actually under control, amen, it has become your God, it has become your master, it has become your Lord, amen, in Jesus' name, why they promise them their liberty, why they promise them freedom, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome. The same is he brought in to the bondage. So even though, listen to me, even though you are fulfilling the desires and the lust of your flesh and the lust and the desires of your thinking and you think you're enjoying life, you are actually once again walking under deceit and lies because you're walking and you're living according to the power, course of this world, according to the course of this world, according to the power and the prince and power of the air. That is Satan. To prove my point, in today's world, there are a lot of habits that are considered diseases. 
It is now known that alcoholism is a disease. Lying is a disease. But what is the true definition of a disease? What is the true definition of a disease? Alcoholism is not a disease. Lying is not a disease. Drug addiction that may have come about because of a disease within itself is not a disease. Thievery or murder is not a disease. It is a sinful habit controlled and governed by a sinful spirit. Amen. But the reason why it's being propagated as diseases is because they're trying to pacify the hearts and minds of individuals so they will not feel condemned by what they are doing. Well, it's just a disease. So if it's a disease, then there is always that hope. You know, I can get better. I'm not doing anything wrong because I'm not responsible for what I have. I've got a disease. I've got a disease. If you get the flu, you have a disease. Amen. You, you, you can't control where you got it from. You can do all the things right. You can wash your hands. You can, amen, wash your face and stay away from people that may be sick and ill. But yet you still can catch it because it's a disease. It is something that is transported, amen, from one person to another, either by human contact or through the air. Amen. That you cannot control. But once you get it, you know that I can probably take some vitamins or I, I, can, I, I can take a, 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 a shot, go to the doctor, you know, and, and get a shot that will give me some antibodies and help me recover and help me strengthen myself, drink some more orange juice or whatever. Amen. So I can overcome this disease that's inflicting my body. And so the same type of thinking comes when it comes to sin. Well, you know, I, I'm not responsible for what I've got. I'm not responsible uh, of, of this sickness because it's a disease. But we need to understand that's a lie from the pits of hell that, yes, we are responsible for our actions. Yes, we are responsible for our disease. So you see, when they begin to speak, amen, they speak words of deceitfulness. They speak words of corruption that will bring corruption to your life because a sin that is not taken care of will cause you to spiritually die. You will be twice dead and plucked up by the roots, as Jude said in Jude chapter number 1. So let's look at this for a moment. They say that to pacify the hearts and minds of individuals. So let's use that premise just for a moment. The disease of sin is not any less deadly because it will eat your life without inflicting pain. The pestilence of sin is not any less awful because it comes without grieving or giving notice of his presence. Amen. Satan is not the less real or less destructive because he works his work upon our souls without our even being conscious of his approach because we are living in a false freedom. We are living under an illusion. And the only way that we're going to escape that illusion, any way that we are going to escape that bondage, if we heed to the call of the gospel and remind ourselves and realize that I am only truly free in Jesus Christ, he will break those walls. Amen. He will tear down the barriers. Amen. He will set me free. He will break those chains, and I will begin to have life, and I will begin to have it more abundantly. One of, Satan's, one of Satan's chief tools for getting people to disobey God, as I said, is just simply lies because he is a liar. John 8, 44, you are of your father the devil, and it is the lust of your flesh you do, the lust of the, your father you do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So when you listen to his word, when you listen to his deception, you may think you have freedom, but in actuality you are in bondage because it is his will. It is Satan's will that you will practice the lust and the gratification of the desires of your flesh, which are characteristic of Satan himself. Amen. We see this way in the beginning when Satan told Eve, you shall not surely die. You shall not surely die. And in one sense, he was correct. Because when Adam and Eve ate the fruit of that tree, they weren't struck dead. 
A lightning bolt from heaven did not come down and zap them, but yet they had death. Now they had death in their mortal bodies. They who were almost to the point of eternal now began to die a little by a little. But even more important than the physical death which they did not experience, now they experienced a greater death, and that was separation from God because they were expelled out of the kingdom. They were expelled. And the Garden of Eden, if you will, was a representation of the kingdom of God. But they did that one thing that the Lord told them not to. You shall not die, Satan said. But yet when they ate of that fruit, they did die. Not in the thought process that they immediately thought they might have, well, if I eat this, I'm just going to drop down dead as a doornail. No, 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 no. Amen. For Adam, it was over 900 years before they laid his body in the ground. Amen. I don't know how old Eve was, amen, before she died. Amen. But yet for 900 years, he lived in separation from God. And he worked by the sweat of his brow. And he knew what it was like, amen, now because of that death that was happening within his body that he began to have backaches. All of you that have backaches and arthritis, just thank Adam and Eve for that. Just said, thank you. That cough that you got, thank Adam and Eve for it. Amen. Because there was none of that before they disobeyed God. But Satan said, you shall not die. And so he lies to us. He gives you a false sense of freedom that you can become like God. You will know good and evil. You'll be able to do what you want to do. You'll be able to live the way that you want to live. And so the course of human history was changed because now the human race was plunged into sin. And he tells the unsaved today, and he also tells the saved today, amen, disobey God, disobey God. That's not important. That's irrelevant. You don't need to listen to that. You don't need to listen to this. You don't need to do that. You don't need to do this. But when a person believes and practices a lie, he becomes a child of disobedience. And the freedom that he thought that they had, he had, now becomes a false freedom, and it puts you in the bondage. And that bondage is going to lead you to destruction. Satan has whispered in the heart of many people, are you enjoying life? Are you doing what you really want to do, walking the way you want to walk? Are you living the way that you want to live? But when you pull back the covers, you begin to see that you are under bondage, which will lead to spiritual destruction. Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 16. He said, Know ye not that to whom ye yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? You're going to be a slave to something. You're either going to be a slave to sin, a slave to your passion, a slave to your desire, but the devil masks that and say, hey, you're living life. You're doing what you want to do. Ain't nobody telling you nothing. But you have become a slave to disobedience. It has become your master. Or we have a choice that I can become a slave to righteousness. I can yield my serf to become a servant of righteousness. And the Bible tells me, this is not a word for word, but it does say this, amen, that the, my God is not a hard taskmaster, amen, but he brings life, he brings joy, and he brings peace to me. So I'd rather serve him. I'd rather yield myself to him. I'd rather walk and live under the freedom of righteousness and the liberty of righteousness and godliness than yielding myself, amen, to sin and become its servant where it's going to lead me to destruction and to bondage. Yes, now let's go down to verse number 20. For if you were the servants of sin, if you serve sin, if you live sin, you were free from righteousness. And then the Bible goes on to say, what fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? You know, when I thought I was living like the way I wanted to live, and I come into truth, I come into the presence of God, I'm ashamed of my old life. 
There are things that nobody knows about, not even my wife, and she will never know. Amen. Because I am ashamed of those things that I once did. But you know what? Ever since I've been serving God, I'm not ashamed of living for him. I'm not, a, come on, I'm not ashamed of serving him. I'm not ashamed of worshiping and praising him. Do you not know that whatever you continually give yourselves to, to anyone or to anything, you are the slaves of that person. You are the slaves of that thing. Amen. And it will lead you either unto death or it will lead you unto right standing in God. What is the path you want to take? What is the course that you want to take? What is that you want to experience in your life? Do you want to experience the joy and the peace of God? So when you were the slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. But what benefit did you get from those things of which you and I were ashamed? Paul said this, for the end of those things is death. The end of those things is death. But Paul went on to say in Romans 7, 23, he said, but I see a, another law warring in my members, amen, against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. He said, I discern in my body, amen, in, in the sensitive appetites of the will, of flesh and, and a desire, a different law, a different rule of action that is fighting with inside of me. Amen. And it is that law that brings me to sin that dwells with inside of me. So it has become my master. But then he goes on to say, thank God that Jesus set me free. Yeah. Thank God, come on, that Jesus set me free. Are you listening to me tonight, church? Are you hearing what I'm saying tonight? You do not need to walk under and in under the influence of a false freedom where Jesus has come to set you free, that he will satisfy your heart. He will satisfy your life. He will satisfy your soul. He will satisfy your spirit. He will give you what you need to make it until Jesus comes again. Again. So our scripture reading says a person is a slave to whatever has mastered him. So the question I want to ask you today, what controls you or who controls you? What controls you or who controls you? I know sometimes people say, well, I can't help myself because I'm Irish. That's why I got an attitude. Or I'm redheaded. That's why I got a fiery temper. Or I'm this, I'm that. My wife has got part Cherokee in her. And uh, whenever she gets mad at me, I say, uh-oh, engine's on the war path. Amen. But let me tell you something. It has nothing to do with your pedigree. It has nothing to do with your background. It doesn't matter what it has to do with the color of your hair or your nationality. What it has to do is who are you yielding yourself to? Who has control in your life? Who has control in your spirit? Are you living under a false freedom or are you living in the freedom and the power of God? Whatever has control over you, you are under its bondage. I want Jesus to have control. I want Jesus to have preeminence. I want Jesus to be preeminent in my life. I want to be under his control. Amen. I want him to be Lord of my life. I don't want to live under a false freedom. Because the only true freedom comes from Jesus. Luke chapter 4 and verse number 18. Jesus said, and he's speaking from Isaiah chapter 61, and we'll read it in a moment. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And he has called me to preach deliverance to the captives. We don't have to live a life of captivity anymore. Isaiah 61 and 1 says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me up to bind the brokenhearted. 
and to proclaim liberty to the captives. Jesus said to preach deliverance to the captives. Isaiah said proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. I am here to tell you there is a spirit in this house tonight and there are words that are being ministered to your heart that can bring you liberty, that can bring you freedom, that can bring you anointing tonight. You don't have to go out of these doors walking under a false freedom anymore, walking under a false pretense anymore, but there is freedom and there is liberty because Jesus has come to set you free and break the chains of bondage and break the chains of sin that you can walk in liberty and in the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said in John 8, 32 through 36, and you shall know the truth. And people always quote this scripture wrong. And you shall know the truth, and people say, and the truth shall set you free. Folks, it does more than set you free. It makes you free. I said, it makes you free. And if something makes you free, that tells me you do not have to come back under its bondage anymore. And they answered him, verse 33, we be Abraham's seed, and we were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou you shall be made free? And Jesus said, in the same words as Paul said, and Peter said, Amen, verily I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. You're a servant of sin. You're a servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall not set you free, but make you free, you shall be free indeed. You shall be free indeed. Do you want to walk in freedom and liberty? Yes, the Bible says, let's go back to Romans chapter 6. Again, beginning with verse number 16, know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But now let's read verse number 18 and 19, or verse 17 and 18, which we did not read before. But God be thanked that you were, woo, you were, you were, does not Paul say in 1 Corinthians and such, chapter 6, and such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, and you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul says here, but God be thanked, you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed, you have listened, you have submitted, you have given yourself, you have made from the heart that form of doctrine which was has delivered you. Thank God for the word that will set us free. Verse number 18. The scripture says, being then made free from sin. Not set free from sin, but made free from sin. The words of God will make you free. Amen. You became the servants of righteousness. And as I become a servant of righteousness, then I am going to live under true freedom. I am going to live under true anointing. Although it may seem like a contradiction, the only true freedom in Christ comes to those who are his slave. That's a concept that's hard for us to grasp. But the only true freedom in Christ comes to those who are his slaves, who are his servants. Slavery has come to mean degradation, hardship, inequity. But the biblical paragraph Amen. Of true freedom is being a slave of Christ who enjoys peace, who enjoys joy. Amen. The products of only true freedom that comes from a Lord and Savior, our Messiah, Jesus Christ. Being made free from sin, we are now under the control of Jesus. He has become our master. Romans 6.22 goes on to say, but now being made free from sin... You have become servants to God, and you have your fruit unto holiness and the end, everlasting life. 
That's where our freedom leads us to. That's what our freedom is going to give us. Amen. Fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. I quoted this earlier, but let's read 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. What does this mean? It simply means there is emanciation from bondage. Amen. There is emanciation from slavery. There is emancipation. Amen. From sin. And now I have freedom. I have freedom. I have freedom. So what is liberty? What is freedom? Amen. It is the freedom that I have in Jesus Christ that I will fortify my mind. I will begin to think different thoughts. I will begin to think upon his word. Amen. I will have the willpower that comes through the Holy Ghost. Not something that I can derive from my own strength, but God gives me power. Acts 1 and 8 says, but you shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost is come upon you. So I have that liberty. I have that power that comes from Jesus Christ. Amen. And as I walk with him, as I live with him, as I live in him, then I can make every day adjustments that need to be made so I can continue to walk in the freedom that God would have me to walk in. What is the Christian life? The Christian life is simply Death to self, death to desires, death to passion, death to wants. And it's waking up to walk in the newness of life. That is the newness of the Spirit of God that lives with inside of us. Paul said it like this in Romans 6 and 4. Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism. You know, it's amazing. A lot of people say baptism is really not important. But baptism is important because it is a burial. When I repent of my sins and I tell God I'm sorry for my sins, I go down in that watery grave in the name of Jesus Christ. I am burying that old man. I am burying that old nature. And that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. That's why Jesus said in John 3 and 5, you must be born again of water and spirit because it is the newness of life. Then skipping down to verse number 8, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we should also live in him. We believe we should also live in him. The new life of freedom, the new life that God gives to us is characterized by our thoughts, by our meditations that we think about him who saved us. Not thoughts about flesh, not thoughts about what I once did. Amen. But I am thinking about him who rose from the dead, that rises me from the dead, that I can walk in power, I can walk in peace, I can walk in liberty, and I can walk in freedom. And so we strengthen our nature. We strengthen that new man by feeding on the Word of God. In the book of Psalms, Chapter 1 and verse number 1, 2, and 3. Psalms chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. Let me turn here. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But blessed is the man that his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And when we think upon him and we dwell upon him, then verse 3 gives us the promise that we shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth, they shall prosper. So I can be strengthened. I can have new life. I can have the blessing of new life. Through prayer and through the Word of God, I obtain the power that we need 
to stay away from the old sinful man. You know, there's nothing out there that I want to go back to. And as far as being a bad boy, I really wasn't that bad. I was mischievous, yes. I did things that I shouldn't have done, yes. But as far as what the world considers bad boy, I wasn't a bad boy. But in God's sight, I needed Jesus. I needed Jesus. I was talking to someone the other day. I forget who I was talking to. But he, he was talking to me about his old life, about how he used to get drunk. I said, I, I never drank. But I said, there was one time in my life I wanted to know what it was like to get drunk. I, I wanted to experience that feeling. Not that I had any desire to. I just wanted to experience it to see what everybody was talking about. And so I, I drank a bunch of champagne, drank a bunch of champagne, drank a bunch of champagne. Didn't get drunk, but I was sure miserable. Amen. I don't want the old life. There's nothing there. There is nothing there. And it's a lie of the devil as we stand that tells you, just go ahead. Don't listen to that preacher. Don't listen to God. You can do what you want to do, and you'll have freedom. You'll have freedom, but you're going to find out that freedom that you have is actually bondage that's going to destroy you. Realize that being a slave to Christ as we stand, a servant to Christ is the only way to obtain true freedom. Our scripture reading says one more time, Sister Janiah, if you can put Second Peter back up there. Amen, real quick, so I can read it one more time. Our scripture reading. Why they promised them liberty. They, speaking about the false teachers, are the servants of corruption. But then Peter sort of switches gears, and he says, For of whom a man is overcome, or oh, whatever overcomes you, whatever controls you, amen, you are brought into bondage to that thing or person. In other words, they have become your Lord, and you be, have become their servant. I want to become a servant of Jesus. I want to become a slave to Jesus. Let's lift our hands and let's love the Lord tonight. Let's lift our hands and worship the Lord tonight. Let's cry out to God in the name of Jesus. Let's magnify the Lord in the name of Jesus. Come on, let's talk to the Lord right now. Let's worship the Lord right now. Let's magnify the Lord.